Good evening. Attempt number two. Uh, if you will, be turning to Romans chapter 8. That's where our message is going to be out of this evening. As I read it, uh, two verses just stuck out to me. I want to have that for our scripture reading this evening. But, uh, as you're turning there, Romans chapter 8, uh, let's remember Brother Bob for tomorrow. Um, as he goes in for some surgeries, one in the morning, one in the evening. And then uh, Eddie Vargas, there are many of y'all know him from Acumba. Uh, he's home with hospice care, got stage four cancer in his, I think, liver, pancreas, and lung, one, one of his lungs, I think. And uh, he's uh, physically not doing well, but I've been told that he's uh, been real strong and he won't let anybody feel sorry for him, and that's a, that encourages me. That's good. I pray I'm giving that grace when it comes that time. Remember them in prayer as you're able. Romans chapter 8, read the last two verses. Begin verse 38, Romans 8, 38. Paul writes, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, Lord. What a comfort. Give us the assurance in Christ and keep our hearts on Him, Lord. As it pleases you, enable us to pray for our brethren and comfort them. There's so many that we love that are in heavy trial right now. Lord, we ask you to give them the grace to be comforted in Christ alone and to look to Him. Be with our brethren everywhere, Lord. Keep us. Forgive us our sins. For Christ's sake we ask it. Amen. If you're still in Romans 8, we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 17 this evening. Romans 8, verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together and this evening I'd like to look at verses 11 through 17 but I want to briefly look through 11 through 15 and that will lead us up to verse 16 and 17 the title message tonight is a protected inheritance protected inheritance. Look there in verse 11 again. Romans 8, 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. This body that you and me and all men and women walk around in, it gets sick. 
It has diseases. It goes through trials. And because of that sin that we are, sin that's in these old bodies, one day we're going to die. This body will be no more. But, but if the Spirit of God dwells in us, He's made His abode in us, if we're given a new heart to that new birth, if we're quickened, if we're made alive in a new spirit, the death of this mortal body is not the end. This body we are in will be raised from the grave, made perfect, made like Christ in His image. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Some throughout time, in Paul's day, before then, and now in our day, they've said that there will be no resurrection. They say that once this life's over, once you close your eyes for the last time, that's it. What a horrible thought. We talk about people saying that they live for themselves, live for the flesh, and they have no rule of law over them. They're antinomian. They can't be bound. That's a prime candidate. This was all the hope I had in this world, but was this world, I'd, I'd be hiding somewhere. <laughs> I'd be doing something wrong. I'd be living for myself only. But this isn't something new. These people walk around and preach this, and they knock on doors and tell people this, gently, because they don't want people to think they're crazy. This isn't something new. Look here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. He's saying that if we have no hope, everyone else that believed Christ that walked this earth has no hope. They'll perish. We're going to perish. And it's all perishing. It's all dead. If in this life only, verse 19, we have hope in Christ, if we only trust Him, we only have this good news for what time we walk in this earth, for this season, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, and by man came also the resurrection of dead. What's he talking about? For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ, the God man, shall all be made alive. This world is not the end of believers. We will not taste that second death, that never ending death. We'll be conformed to the image of Christ. He's risen. He will raise us. Preacher, what that, what's it going to be like? I don't know. <laughs> I try to dwell on these things. I want to be focused on those things above. But we saw just a, a few messages, messages ago what John told us. There in 1 John he said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We don't know what we're going to be like. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. Because we shall see Him as He is. That's what I want to be made like. I don't care if I'm tall or short. Or if, I, if I'm just as ugly as I am now. I'm going to be like Him. I'll be able to see Him. Be with Him. I'm back in our text. There in Romans chapter 8. Because we're given a new spirit. We are made alive right now in Christ. We have no condemnation before the Father. We're not ruled and reigned by this flesh because the Spirit dwells in us. And we have eternal hope through the resurrection of Christ. Because He lives, we have hope to live. And look in there in verse 12, Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brethren, because all this, therefore, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. 
Because of that redemptive work of Christ on Calvary's cross, we are not bound to this world and we're not bound to that old nature. We're freed from sin. We're freed from death. In our new birth, we're made alive to God. We live for Him. We are His debtors, not this world's debtors. Our new heart's made alive by God. It looks on heavenly things. We're concerned and our affections are set on things above. That's what that new man's concern is. But being freed from this flesh, being freed from that condemnation that Christ bore for His elect, that does not mean we're freed from obedience. We are not freed from believing Christ. We're not freed from loving our brethren. We're not freed from the fruits of the Spirit. From love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. We're not freed from those things. We're ruled by and motivated by our love for Christ and His love for us. Paul told the church at Corinth, for the love of Christ constraineth us. That's what we're ruled by. That's what constrains us. Because we, we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. That means if it was needful for Christ to die for me, I was a dead man walking. I had a death sentence. It was needful. That was the punishment. And that He died for all, all His elect. They which should live should not live henceforth unto themselves out of that debt of gratitude, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. That's who we live for. That new man strives after our Master. The one that died for us. Now is this just Paul showing us this? Paul telling us here in Romans, Paul telling us in Corinthians. So he just want to make, is Paul the one showing us that the love of Christ for his people is what makes us serve and be debtors to the Lord? We just saw last week too, John told us that plainly. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought, debt of gratitude, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, those saved by grace have nothing against serving the Master. I've had people say, well, you, you're bound to Christ. Amen. I pray I am. What a blessing. That's a privilege to serve Him. It's not a burden. It's a privilege. We're allowed to serve Him. We were sentenced to death in our old nature from Adam. And Christ secured His and the Father's glory and honor in upholding that law and dying for the sheep and freeing us from sin and death. Therefore, we are debtors to His love and we're debtors to His glory. What a wonderful thing to be a debtor to. All right, back to our text there in Romans chapter 8. What are the facts that come with man's motivation? What are the results of either... Living after the Spirit or living after the flesh. Here Romans 8, verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. If you're living for your flesh and by your flesh, you are still dead in sin, and only eternal death waits. Only eternal condemnation. That's the only thing that lies ahead. If you trust in something you did, you trust in something you said, something you thought to save your soul, living after that flesh, you shall die. You ain't going to make it. But if you mortify the deeds of the flesh, what's that mean? We put down, we crush, we subdue, we hate, we despise, we loathe. We despise our works and our ability. We're humiliated by our attempts at righteousness then that conviction of sin is through the Spirit. We are against that death that we are because now we have life in Christ. And, and, we're not dead. We're freed from all that. We now have life in Christ. And we're not only given life and ruled by Christ, not by this flesh, we are made sons. Those that believe on Christ are children of the Almighty God. You're His child. Look at verse 14. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are 
the sons of God. Here's the evidence. We are the sons of God. We are led by the Spirit. We are led to praise God alone, not man. We're led to worship Christ alone. We're led to mortify this body of death. Put it down. We're led to live for His glory and the furtherance of His gospel. Turn over to uh, John 16. We'll mark our place there in John 16. If you've got two markers or a piece of paper, we'll come back to it later. But does a man choose to give Christ the glory? Is that something that we muster up in this old flesh? Do we convince ourselves and build upon our faith to believe Christ and worship Him? We're in John 16. Verse 13. Albeit, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. He shall glorify Me, for He shall receive of Mine, and shall, and shall, Show it unto you. There's going to be a revelation. There's going to be a work done. Not a work posed. Not a work offered. When that Spirit comes, He's going to glorify Christ, that great Comforter, and He shall show it unto you. He's going to show you Christ's glory. Your He is. Being led by the Holy Spirit, we glorify Christ and not ourselves. We glorify Him. This is the proof that our salvation is is the work of God solely and that we're made His children. Back in our text there. If you can mark your place in John 16, back to our text there in Romans 8. Being made sons, being made the children of God through that effectual work of Christ, we don't fear condemnation. We are freed from condemnation. We fear the Lord in honor and in respect, but not in punishment. The condemnation is gone. Romans 8.15 For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We are adopted, are the adopted children of God, and we as little children, dependent only on our Father for all things, we cry for Him. Abba, Father. Father, Father is what the word means. Daddy, daddy. Cry for them. Some of you people have children. And your children may show me something. They may be happy about something. Come to me. They may have a little bit of concern and come to me. But they won't come to me as they'll come to their parents. When we're in true pain, or we're in true joy, when a child is, you cry to the one that loves you and the one that you love. Your parent. The saints of God have been loved by Christ through that sin-atoning sacrifice He made for us. We've been made one with Him. And through Him loving us first, we love Him. And only because we have been made His sons and daughters, we cry to our Heavenly Father. We come to Him with all things. And I was thinking of that illustration. I think Clay used it, but we talked about Love. How Christ loved us. When we were yet sinners, when we were babes in Christ, when we're unable, when we're unknowledgeable. We don't know nothing about Him. You see a mo mother or a father with a little newborn baby. What's that baby do? It cries. It eats. It messes its diaper and it sleeps. That's it. It doesn't know anything. It doesn't do anything productive. It's nothing but work. But you love it. Oh, you love it. And you care for it. And you provide for it. And you give it security. And you watch after it. And then when that child gets a little bit older, a little bit bigger, just a few months old, a newborn baby that doesn't do anything, you can hold it. And if its mommy walks in the room and it makes eyes with her, it'll start crying on it. Want to mommy. <laughs> I don't even know its name's mommy. It'll start crying after that parent. Oh, father, father. We don't have to know much. We just have to be his child. All right, verse 16, Romans 8, 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit 
that we are the children of God. To those born again, the Holy Spirit witnesses to our new nature, to our new spirit, that we are the eternally secured children of God. However, my old man often doubts that. Do you? Do you doubt? Am I a child of God? Do you have moments of insecurity, unbelief, doubt, times of worry, wondering if you're the chi a child of God, if Christ died for you? Am I one of them that He died for? Am I one of the elect? When we look around us, or we look in us, there's two big reasons that we doubt our salvation. First off, we see a glimpse of how great and wonderful this blessing of salvation is. We see how great it is. Romans 11 says, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that He might have mercy upon them all. He looked at all his children. He said, none of them believe me. I'm going to have mercy on them. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. We can't wreck our minds around the majesty of the grace of God in Christ. His love for his people was so perfect. And he sent his son to this earth to be made like us, to be made a man. He lived a perfect life on behalf of his people underneath that holy law of God, obeying every jot and tittle. And he suffered and died that shame on a cross, all while being perfectly righteous without sin. He knew no sin. So we could be made his righteous. That's so unsearchable. Believers are prone to doubt that such wonderfulness and great blessings are already ours. That's done. If you're His, that's yours. He did that for you. Christ died for you. Why would we be so prone to think this is too good to be true? Why is that? The second reason. First reason we see how wonderful how majestic salvation is through Christ. The second reason we're so quick to doubt that adoption, that sonship, is because we see a glimpse of just how sinful and unworthy we truly are. How undeserving we are. The understanding of our sin is not through a lot of reasoning. We don't understand our sin because we sat down and read the Bible a whole bunch. The knowledge of of what we are does not come from our admission of guilt. I was wrong. Well, say no wrong don't convict you of sin. It comes from the heart work and the conviction that the Holy Spirit gives. That comforter comes and convicts of sin. Now let's look back there in John 16 again. John 16, the conviction of sin is not the only thing that the Spirit convicts us of. Look here in John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Christ is going to send the Comforter to his people. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. He was righteous. He was accepted by the Father. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Prince of darkness is already judged. The children of God, those adopted by the Father through Christ Jesus our Lord, we are shown by the Holy Spirit what we are. Sin. We're convicted of sin. We're shown in our hearts who and what Christ is. Righteousness. He is righteousness. And in addition to those two things, we're shown what holy and true judgment is. 
holiness of the Father to punish the sin that we are in His Son. And that from finishing that salvation, Christ accomplished work for His elect. He's glorified, He's ruling, He's judging, and He's reigning right now in all things. That's the proof His work was accepted. We have an empty tomb. We don't have a tomb of bones. It's empty. Why? He's accepted. It's done. Finished. And we're made to know these things. That's how John could tell us here in 1 John 5, and we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. It's Him. And we're made to know Him. That's not a burden of, to be a debtor to that. That's good news. Worldly, my children know me. You young people know me. You all know I love you. You know I provide for you. You know I keep you safe. But there's times that you doubt that. There's times you've been afraid. Even if I'm standing next to you. But that does not affect my ability or my determination to be a father to you. Whether you question me or not, that doesn't change what I'm going to do. And that's on this earth. The Lord asked those disciples, He said, which one of you, if your children come and say they're hungry, they want a fish, you will give them a scorpion? He said, and you're evil. And you know better than that. How much more your heavenly Father He'll provide for you. And my children doubting me doesn't make them any less my children. That doesn't change. Back to our text in Romans 8. But just as human children, they doubt and they trust. They fear and they love. Spiritual children have times of weakness and times of strength too. But nothing changes our Heavenly Father's holy love for us. Nothing changes His almighty ability to preserve us forever. We're still His heir. We are still His children. No matter what we are, we're His. Look there in verse 17, Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. And joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Now in parts of this chapter, Paul says we're sons. I know a lot, some, some people nowadays don't like that. Men, man, sons, the male part. Another part says children. Why does he say both? Why is that? Well, in Roman law, a natural born child or an adopted child, either one, male or female, they were all equal in being heirs of their parents. It didn't matter. Now, in Jewish law, for the Jews, the daughters did not receive the inheritance of the parents unless there was no male heir. He had to be a son. So regardless of what, what was Paul getting at? Regardless of man's law, whether it's Roman law, if it's a Jewish law, or it's some law we have nowadays, however you cut it, whatever law you was raised under, all the saints of God are fully His heir. Jew or Greek, male or female, rich or poor, educated or uneducated. It doesn't matter. There's no ranks, there's no degrees of children. We're all joint heirs with Christ. And like Bob brought to us Sunday, that illustration of that, that man came to Christ and said, talk to my brother and make him share that inheritance with me. Because the firstborn got the lion's share of the inheritance. They got the bulk of it. And he wanted everything to be even. Between, between us, between the children of God, it's even. We have Christ. He is our inheritance. If somebody's wanting a, a stone in their crown, I feel sorry for them. They might just get it and miss him. 
And if the two-thirds of the share goes to our elder brother, glory be to him. <laughs> Let him have it. How does a person in this country right now become an heir? We're born or we are adopted by someone. And that becomes our parent. And then when they die, we receive whatever they have declared is ours. They said, I'm going to leave this to you. And that's what you get. But sometimes, sadly, in families there's lawsuits and there's fights over who gets what or who gets how much of what. Worldly, that parent is dead and they cannot defend their wishes. They cannot see that matter straight. And in some cases, family members cave. They give in to a sibling. And I say, that's fine. You can have, I know mom said you had to get this part of it. And you, can, you can have another part of it. They'll give in to their siblings. Or, worse off, a court will rule in favor against the last will and testament of someone. Those are worldly things. But that benefactor's wishes were not honored. They were not granted. So in our day and time, being an heir is not necessarily something that's guaranteed. I want to leave you children everything I have. You may get it, you may not. The state might take it. But our God, our Father, He lives. Christ is sitting on the right hand of the throne of all grace and all power. And he's interceding and controlling all things on our behalf. And He will, His will must be performed in earth and in heaven. His inheritance is not going to be misgiven. His will and testament will be honored. What He declares is going to happen. By His power, He's going to make sure of it. And He's alive to defend it. And He will govern his eternal will in the daily lives of His people. Not only in our eternal blessings, but in our daily blessings. What are our daily blessings? Sometimes it's a time of trial. The Lord sends that to His children. Sometimes it's a time of joy. He sends that to His children. Sometimes it's a time of great persecution. He sends that to His children all of which He uses to chasten His children out of love, out of mercy, pointing us yet again back to our Redeemer. Teaching us that we were made joint heirs with Christ. Meaning that our sonship is through Him and it's with Him. And no one can pluck us from His hand. We're eternally secure in Him. All right, Romans 8, 17 again. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. It says there, if we suffer with Him. And that gives the children of God two different comforts. First, we're one with Christ. When He suffered, He bled, He died, His children suffered and bled and died. We had to be one with Him. We're one with Him now. That is how we died to sin. That's how we died to death. That's how we're freed from condemnation of the law. And being in Him, in His life, His death, His burial, we are one with Him as He's raised from the grave. As He lives right now, so we live. We're alive in Him. Now the second comfort of suffering with Christ as we know, because our Master suffered on this earth, we're going to suffer too. The Lord told us that. He said, there must be heresies. There must be trials. That's going to come. That's going to happen. And I always find it easier to bear a trial if I know it's coming. Do you like being blindsided? I like knowing something's coming. Trials are coming. If your head, you're going to suffer with it. Our Master suffered and our and the servant's not above his master. Hardships must come. And when that hard trial comes, for his sake and for his glory, we can be reassured once again where he is. You have everything easy in this life. No, no speed bumps in the road of life. Be weary. Our confidence rests only in him. And we, with, that, with Apostle Paul, 
He wrote to us in Philippians 3, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. Now, if we're His, if we're a child, and He's able to subdue all things unto Himself, why do I worry? Why, why do I get sad? Why do I get down? I'm His. He's able to subdue all things. That includes me and everything around me. Why would I fear? Why would a, a, a believer has no excuse to not walk through this life the happiest, most peace, peaceful, confident, and calm person that ever lived? It's all right. Our Father rules and reigns. Christ lives. And I'm a joint heir with Him, and my condemnation's gone. That's eternally secure. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank You for preserving Your Word. Lord, let us let us see what we are. Let us see what Christ has accomplished for us and in us. Lord, keep us forever looking to Him. Let us see that He is our inheritance. What a precious gift of being without sin, being in Your presence, and be able to worship truly and as You deserve. Lord, keep us until that day. Forgive us for what we are. Be with us through the week as we live in this world. And let us be a good example to all those around us, Lord. Don't let us bring reproach on your gospel. What a blessing it is to be able to hear it. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your Son. It's in Christ's name that we ask these things. Amen.